Hi everyone, it's Nono here and welcome to Live 14. Today we don't really have a super clear agenda. Welcome to the machine learning series. This is the Live channel, a place where I try to share things that have to do with machine learning, artificial intelligence, creative coding, workflow optimization, and more stuff. You can uh, like this video if you would like to keep seeing this type of content over the next weeks. And if you're enjoying past videos, and subscribe if you want to get notified when I go live or when I upload new videos. You can also join us on the community. This is the Discord server that we have for Getting Simple and the machine learning live series and, and everything that has to do with coding. You can go to none of the mass last Discord to accept the invite and join us over there. Last week we covered a recap on the machine learning technologies that we've done over the past months, I would say, focusing mainly on Teachable Machine, Runway, Love, and TensorFlow.js. Just taking a look at how those tools make it a bit easier to understand machine learning at a high level and train machine learning algorithms without actually needing any line of code, except for TensorFlow.js, which offers an API to fully code neural networks and other algorithms using TensorFlow in JavaScript. All right, so I can see here Andres. So hi, Andres. Welcome to the channel. I saw that you joined the, the Discord community some time ago. I'm glad to see you around. And Pedro, nice to see you again. I know that, that you know, over the break has been a bit hard to, to be around. And John Mark, <laughs> I cannot do anything with that. If you're cooking, maybe just watch the recording later. But yeah, thanks everyone for being around. The, the gist of now is we don't really have a, a clear agenda and I would like to hear from you before we get started what things are you intending to learn with this live stream or what things you would like to see next. I just wanted to show web technologies that I have been using on my own to build websites and build web apps that interact with machine learning apps or with other libraries. Over the last weeks I've been building this document that, that you can see here in which I haven't yet shared. So I, I need to, I have some homework to do to share this document so you guys can browse through it and just look at the notes and look at the links and things like that. For each live stream, we've been covering different topics. And today, as I said, is not super close yet what we're going to see, but I'm open for suggestions. So one of the things that I've been, I've shown on the channel, but we haven't used is blotter.js that has nothing to do with machine learning, but has to do with web technologies. Another thing that I've mentioned and I want to take a look at here is Laravel. So this is how to build a, a simple website. Laravel is a framework to build websites in PHP in some way similar to what you can do or a tiny functionality of Laravel allows you to do what you can do with Node.js Express, but it has a lot more tools to build and deploy uh, Laravel apps, which are, it can be applications on your computer, but this framework is thought to build website applications that can run on production on your own uh, server and hosting your website and web apps. Then there is this thing that I wanted to take a look at, the Apple's Vision and Core ML project to recognize objects in live capture. And also I mentioned to the M MacBook laptops. So I have, let me just show this link here. So there is still uncertainty about how the Apple M1 new laptops are going to perform with machine learning, with TensorFlow and with training or inferencing. There is some benchmarking that RoboFlow has done here that I was taking a look at. I have personally ordered one of these notebooks. So the MacBook Pro, the, the 13 inch. And what I'm looking to do is to explore in this channel how that laptop makes it easier or possible to do machine learning on a Mac laptop. And because before, for those who don't know about it, TensorFlow only works with GPUs that is making TensorFlow computations on the graphics card with laptops or computers that have access to an NVIDIA GPU. And now other devices are also adding compatibility with TensorFlow's GPU execution. One of those is the M1 chips that ship with the new or the latest Apple MacBooks. That means that Apple has worked with TensorFlow together to create a build of TensorFlow that is going to be able to take advantage of the new GPU and hardware uh, chip architecture on, on these laptops. This is something that Apple was doing before already on iPads and iPhones. 
with their neural engine and are trying to look at how to bring into desktop computing on the Mac suite. And as far as I know, I think some of the algorithms on Photoshop that use this sort of technology have been adapted to work with these new GPUs and work a lot faster. This is using machine learning uh, algorithms on device while using Photoshop. And those, as far as I heard on the demos or on the, some of the presentations, times can be up to nine times faster, I think, in some of the artificial intelligence operations in Photoshop. All right. So this is, you can take a bit of a look at this benchmark, but I think what it says is, let me just take a, a look again here. They're trying to compare how uh, the YOLO V2 object detection model works when trained over 5,000 epochs on, on one of these laptops. And as far as I've seen, I don't think that these Macs or, or at least the software is completely ready to, to work with, with Apple M chip, even though as you can see here, Apple claims that their chip works with 11 tops or something that is like trillions operations per second, while Nvidia reaches 14.2 which is still faster. But if these were to work with TensorFlow, that would be a really good advance. All right. And hello, Bea, I see that you're connecting online as well. All right, so let's get out of here. So the other thing I mentioned is this sample project that I'm not gonna take a look at today, but it seems like the Apple's vision framework has native support to train object detection models to, to do object recognition on any Mac or, or iPad application or iPhone application. And this is a, a walkthrough on how, on how to do that, that I'm not going to go through today, but just wanted to point out good practice. I'm going to, to start dropping these links on the machine learning channel of the, well, on the live events channel of the Discord community, this core server. I always forget to do that, but let's try to do it as we go. And Andres, I've met John Mark and Pedro here on the channel some other times. I would invite you to, to introduce yourself on the Discord server or here on the chat to let us know what you're looking for to get from this channel and from joining the, the community. All right, uh, blotter.js. Again, so we've seen this before and this is just a, a really cool, I was gonna say a simple library. This is a really cool library uh, with which you can do this uh, sort of effects on the browser. These are not videos or GIFs. This is a shader based rendering, I think of, of fonts, which is really cool. I particularly like this channel split material and was just trying to take a look at how to implement those on my website to add some effects and, and stuff. So this is something we might take a look at today. All right. So I'm going to focus on Laravel first. So I want to go through a little approximation at how I deploy websites and, and why you might want to use it because I want to do that today because over other videos, I'm going to make use of Laravel and I want to, to introduce you to it a bit. So let's just take a step back quickly here and say Laravel.com. All right. All right. So hi, it's Nona here. And this is just an introduction to Laravel. As you can read here is the PHP framework for web artisans. This is a reinvention, as I understand of how to use PHP to build websites. I personally haven't really liked developing with WordPress over the past years. And I think this framework does a really good job in bringing back PHP as a language, a modern language that will allow you to develop web applications really easily. So this library doesn't only give you things like routing for free. It gives you things like authentication, database management, eloquent ORM that allows you to interact with the database in really clever ways of querying it, passport, and many other things. So if you go into the documentation here at the top, you can see there is a guide on uh, how to get started or what a Laravel is. So if you go here to why Laravel, you can see an explanation that they believe that Laravel is the best choice for building modern full stack web applications. So when they refer to web applications here, you have to understand that you can build a website with many different technologies, such as just HTML5 and JavaScript and CSS, 
just with plain files. But these um, sort of frameworks allow you to build them in a way that is a lot more sustainable, maintainable, and reusable, and a lot easier to build and maintain over time. It's you're not taking the first step into web development and all of its functionality. You can just start with a few things and then uh, keep growing with many different things. For senior developers, I haven't used any of the, almost any of this yet, or, or any of this yet, actually, and I've been using Laravel for a while. They have dependency injection, unit testing queues, and real time events. There is a lot of stuff that you can do with Laravel. But if we go to, to the basics, right, you can see here that they offer routing for free, which is just creating the different pages on your site and serving some content to them. We're going to see that today. Middleware, you can add code that executes before a request is served to the user. CSRF protection, which is a safety measure to make sure that hackers are not doing exploits on your website and sending data in a malicious way. Controllers to make uh, routing a bit easier when you have a lot of code that has to do with something that you can pack in one file logic. Requests, which is uh, also a, a way to make web requests to other APIs and parse the, the responses. Responses to be able to return something, different types of responses on when you're um, returning from a route. Views, which are the, the actual things that you render on the page. Blade templates. Blade is a syntax, a templating syntax that makes it a lot easier to write web views that use PHP and other logic. URL generation, sessions, so they automatically manage user sessions and variables on the session. You can clean them, you, uh, you can clear the cache, or you can store variables, or you can load uh, the user session by authenticating the user, validation, error handling, and logging. And if you dig deeper, you can also see the Artisan console. You can build uh, console commands using PHP, broadcasting to send messages to a lot of people who are subscribed to a service, cache, collections, contracts, events, file storage, a lot of good APIs for file storage using S3 or DigitalOcean or local disks, helper functions to make it easier to use PHP, an HTTP client to make requests, localization to make it really easy to translate your application, mail to be able to send, create mailable views and send email to your customers or notification to yourself and your application using Amazon SaaS, AWS, or, or other services, notifications, package development to create your own plugins, or this is like a NPM packages for PHP, queues, task scheduling, which is awesome if you want to do like recurring backups or other things. For database, they have a lot of uh, really cool stuff as well. As I mentioned, carry building before, Yellowcoin ORM, and, and many other things. All right. So with all of this, I didn't really want to throw a bunch of terms to you, but this is a summary of, of what Laravel is in the abstract. So we haven't really seen anything. Now let's get to code and actually show how to, how you would start by building a Laravel website completely from scratch. And maybe today and other days we can uh, continue growing a bit of this knowledge. So you guys get a bit of an understanding of what this is useful for. Also as a pointer, so you have it in mind if I mention it, there is this page here, DigitalOcean, that is the one that I use to, to host my website. So if you go, for example, to, to gettingsimple.com or none of the man or sketch on none of the man, these websites load really fast as a debugging mechanism. I have here how many seconds or milliseconds takes to load these different pages this is something that you cannot see if you visit publicly, but they load really fast. And if I click from one to the other content is really fast and I'm serving images with something called MGIX. We won't talk about that today. So all of this is hosted and more things on DigitalOcean. So DigitalOcean is a platform to host your, your web applications and they offer a few other services like storage and other like cloud VPN, video streaming hosting, many different things. This is what I use, but today we're going to use a local analog of these things. So you have a web server and today what we're going to see is like this URL here that says none of the test, right? This is something that my computer is mapping to a local folder. So if I click here, you can see that I have a version of my website that is not actually my website. It's just a copy of my website and a copy here in, in this case, an older copy 
of my website's database. So if I go to nono.ma, you can see that today I published this thing, is the latest thing I published, and this one after that, there's no content here after October 13, which is nono.test. It's the, the local copy of my website. All right, how does this work? And what technologies am I using here? I'm using something called Laravel Ballet to serve the website application locally on my machine. And we're going to see that in a second. All right, so let's get started with coding. If I am to do, let's start from the very, very beginning. So if I make here a website, I'm just creating a folder, an empty folder that's called web. And I could here, I could add files so I can enter that folder and I can create a file. So for instance, I can do an index HTML file, some base HTML code. Actually, let's not add all this code here yet. So maybe just say, this is my website and save. So this file gets created, an index.html file. And if I double click, this opens up in here, right? So this is my website. That's all we've done so far. It's an empty HTML website. We don't really have any CSS, any other code, anything, but I could start adding things like HTML tags here. So I could put this inside of my website. So let's say we actually create some HTML structure by hand and we make this maybe a header. Okay, so now we update, we have the header, we can keep editing. This is my paragraph. All right, and then that's working, right? This would be a way which in which we can build a website by hand, right? Manually, and I could even add CSS styling here. So we could say that every font on my site is going to have color, let's say Coral, and the font family is going to be uh, system UI, San Francisco. So this changes the typeface, the text, and if I open the console, so let's say we open the console here, we can even, and we've seen this also on, on the TensorFlow.js tutorial, we saw an introduction to TensorFlow.js. We can see here that we can write code. So for example, this is printing. And if we reload, you see here, we are console logging that text and we could even add things, any other code that we want. So we could add here something like define my variable. So like a, a function that adds two numbers and returns a plus B. And now we console log 10 and three. So we should see 13 there if that works. So we see 13 here. So we're executing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript without any frameworks. We just have a plain text document that I can open here with uh, Visual Studio Code. So if I do code.codeindex.html, so we have this code, and this code is the code that we need to render this website. So we have the, the code here, if we add 100, we can see that our console now is printing and adding those two numbers. This is the old way. This is just manually creating your website and not using any frameworks and just having a plain text document, not even splitting as you would do normally the files of your website in index.html, style.css and script.javascript. The normal way would be that you have these two files here. So for instance, that we have index.html for the HTML code and then load these two assets from the web or from this folder with the style sheet and the JavaScript code, right? So that's, that's an overview on how you would normally make a website and there are ways to making a static web website with Yekil, for instance, which is a block aware static site generator in Ruby. What this does is that from pages from Markdown, for instance, and, and stuff, it generates all the pages of your site. And we're not going to go through this, but this is just that just by installing a command line tool, you would be able to run that and it will generate all the static pages and uh, understanding static as, as the same things that we have here. These are static assets that are not going to dynamically change. Every time we load, we're going to get exactly the same. So static, always the same dynamic. We can dynamically change variables as we'll see with Laravel. This is a plain text, a static website. 
And I mentioned before the tool Valet. If I run here Valet links, I could see a list of the, the websites that are uh, linked here on my computer. So we can see here uh, a set of, of projects that, that we have linked on, on this machine. And we could link this site. So if we do Valet link here, what it does is that it creates a symbolic link to to this folder, right? That if I go here, it's at users, no, no, desktop web. And if I list the files, I have indexed HTML, script.js, and style CSS. All right, so if I go now to web.test, this is loading the files from the folder that we were loading this website before. And if we put the, the console below us, you can see there that we're printing exactly the same. The same code is executing, right? What this means is that Laravel Valet is going to load any web files that are under this folder on the user's nono desktop web when we type web.test. And we could do valet and link web or unlink because we're on this folder and we will remove the sim link. So this URL now, if we update, there's nothing found there. And we could also link to a custom URL. So for example, no dash live and then that links us to no no dash live dot test right so this is prototyping our machine and having this url load the contents of a given folder that's it but there is also engines on the background to be able to to allow to execute this php application a lot of theory there long story short we're going to unlink the no no live here and link again just to have the web dot test URL as we had before. Now this disappears, but this one keeps working. All right, and now we're going to go and see how to create a new Laravel app, right? Now we're not gonna have anything there because the folder is empty. And if we go to the laravel.com website, we're gonna see how to start a new project from scratch, Mac OS, this is to install the installer, but we want to do it with Composer. So Composer, so get composer.org. Composer is the dependency manager for PHP. If you're familiar with Node.js, NPM is the de facto package manager for Node models. And if I look here for something like FS, you can see that the NPM packages you could look for here and, and download. If you go to Composer, you could uh, browse the packages as well in packages. So for example, Folio is a package that I maintain myself. Many packages out there. I use many packages from other people. All right, so this command, Composer, create project Laravel, and then the name of your app creates an empty application that you can uh, start uh, using right away. Hi, Chandra. I see that, that you're joining us today. Thanks for joining. And I'm going to do that now in here. So I'm going to go to my desktop. So I have the, the web folder. So I'm going to remove the, the web folder for now. And we're going to do composer, create project. I think that we'll prefer distribution. I don't think we need to do that now. Laravel, and we're going to call it web, right? So it's going, this command is going to download the Laravel project. It's going to read all the dependencies from the composer.json file of Laravel, and it's going to install all of the dependencies that we need to run this application on our machine. And we're going to see now how that actually works. All right. This seems like it usually takes some time to define what dependency packages you need. Now it downloaded Laravel and now it's going to, to update our dependencies. So that's going to install a bunch of packages that Laravel depends on from composer and we'll be ready to, to start with our application. Let's go to the documentation. So after you start your, or clone your, not clone, you create a Laravel project, you can enter the, the example application and, and then enter the PHP artisan serve command to serve your website. But for us, we, even though we're going to try it, we wouldn't really need to do that because we have the, the valet set up on my machine and we can run the application that way. So this keeps installing dependencies to do, do, do global composer. I don't know if we're going to have to generate the key manually or if this generates automatically or not, but let's see. All right. So it seems like this keeps installing and we're probably going to finish soon. All right. 
So now we have this application ready. So we can, and, and we can see that the application actually generated a key. We missed that part, but if you scroll by, you can see that it said application key generated successfully. If you didn't, you can do this thing, run this command inside of the folder that we created the application. So we have the application here. We can do that application key set successfully. If we do artisan PHP artisan serve, this is going to give us a URL where this is going to be served. So this URL here is loading our website and it's going to show the same contents that if we go to the web.test domain. For me, I think Laravel Palette makes it really easy because uh, we can use these short uh, domains instead of using these uh, complicated URLs and you can personalize them. For example, I have a, a version of getting simple on on my computer and I have this nono clone as well here on the computer. All right. So now we have, just to recap, now we have a web app running on our own uh, computer that, as I said before, we could deploy to the cloud and we could have running. If we have, if we know how to set it up, we could put it on GitHub and get it running in minutes or maybe get another, another setup on DigitalOcean. So there is something to do that, there is something called Digital Ocean LAMP. There is something called LAMP, which is a stack of tools. It's, I don't really know what it stands for, but I know that, what does it stand for? Not sure, but it's a stack of tools that implies that you have Linux, Nginx, MySQL, and PHP. And yeah, the E, I don't really know what it stands for. I know that LAMP is Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, but in LAMP, the E probably stands for engines. So this is a stack of tools that you need to have on your machine to be able to run an application like the one we're running. If I run here, brew services list, because I'm running these services on my machine with homebrew, and you can see that we're going to get listed PHP, my SQL, PHP, my admin and engines. So we have here my SQL engines, PHP and to be my admin. I don't have that here, but because it's not really running as a service, it's just running as a PHP app. But I can go here into my local PHP, my admin installation, and I can browse through databases and see the databases of the, of the different websites that we have there. All right, with that brief comment, we now have a web application or on our own machine, and we're going to, to, to run the code dot command on that very same folder. What that does is that, let me just close and open Visual Studio Code. What that does is that it opens this entire folder on our Visual Studio Code editor. And, and you can see there is a bunch of things here that are contained inside of uh, this Laravel application. The one that we're going to see right now, there's a bunch of things. There is like here application, there's config with a bunch of files that let you customize different things of Laravel. There are here inside of app, there are models. So you can define your object oriented models in PHP console commands. You can add, I'm not going to go into detail into this right now, but what I am going to show you is that on the composer.json file, you're defining here your dependencies as you do on the package.json file inside of Node.js and require dev here are all development uh, dependencies. So things that you wouldn't install in production, but you want to install locally or when in a development environment to be able to inspect errors and debug things on your application more comfortably. The environment file, this is something that never gets committed to GitHub because it contains sensitive information like my app key. For instance, this is something that would uh, compromise some of the security of your application if you share it with others. And the same goes for your username and database password and other things like AWS keys and secrets and other information about the services that you have to connect to. So it's good to have them here and then using this syntax, so environment app name, and then falling back to a default, you can get the value from the environment file or fall back to a default. This means that on your local machine, you can have a value for app underscore name that will define will be defined here. And then on your production server, you can have a completely different, a completely different value for this app name, for instance. All right. So let's go to the fun part on the routes web.php, right? This is where you can register web routes for your application. 
these are loaded, blah, 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 blah. All right, so these web routes here define your the application schema of where people can browse to. Simple thing we can do is if we were to, to write here a route, so I can say a get route, and you can look up on the internet, but there's different types of routes, like post, put, get, any. There's like different types of web requests that you can do. On this route, we'll put here the text to access, right? And this we're gonna change. And now the function with what to return when we load that, this URL, right? So if we save and I go back to my web browser, now I just have to put text to access. So I've written that there. And now this returns this string that I have here. So we're defining, sorry for moving so much, but we're defining here that for this text, when somebody writes it on our website, we're going to define a route that is going to return this string. And if we change this for the slash and we comment this one out, that will be our main page, right? What to return, that simple. And what we want to do now is here, we could copy the code that we defined before. So that HTML code that we put there, for example, with my title, and I'll show you why this is not meant to be done like this, but you could do that. And then the code of your website would be that uh, header one. But how would we usually do this? There's many things that we could do, for instance, before we go into blade templating, we could, for instance, have a, I don't know, we want to make an API to make math over, over the browser or something. We could have this thing here return and, and we could say we are put here, for instance, a number A and then number B, and then our function is going to take parameters A, parameter B. We could return that number, right? Like the addition of those two numbers. So we can now go here and web.test slash add slash and then 100 plus 200. And then what is returned on the site is 300, right? We are passing parameters into the URL and those two numbers are getting added in real time. So we've defined the add API. We have these two variable parameters. And then when we return, we can see the result live in here. And we could do other things. We could also say the result of adding A plus B is, and then put that there. So we have this API. So let's say we add 100 and 999. That's a result. All right. So that is a really simple view at uh, Laravel routing. And I'll probably, I'll try to explain now why this might be useful. Let me go into a really quick water break and I'll be back. And before I go on the break, I will ask you to let me know what you think. If this is something that seems like it's going to be interesting for you to learn or not, I think it's going to be useful for us going forward and looking into some of the other things. I'll be back in, in a quick second. Hello everyone. And hello. I'm glad that you joined. We are taking a quick look today at Laravel as an introduction because we're going to be using it over uh, the next weeks or I don't know, over this year to, to build some of the web apps that we're going to do with machine learning and with some of the interactive applications that we are going to be looking at here. So we were, just to do a quick recap, we were building a simple API get route here that we call add just to add two numbers over a, a web application, right? So here we've added this text, but as we had it before, we could just simply return the result of this addition here. So we add, for instance, 10,010, right? So we're just adding those two numbers here and we could we could add other apis here let's say we call them multiply or mul and then subtract and we just need to to change the the symbols here and try that multiply works and subtract works as well all right hi sujay also welcome to the to the stream glad to see you around and 
yeah, so that's that's just a quick look at routes. So we're gonna remove these ones here. And one thing that you would do, then this is the thing that usually you don't return a string here, even though you can you can define variables here and do things like this here in PHP, and you can, for instance, put a paragraph here and print your text. So let's say we're gonna put here name space and then year right so we could do this and when we load the the website we can see that that's loading properly i forgot to add a space here but this is not the way to do these things either so what we will do is that we will serve a view right so we will serve a view to that url so we will return a view and then we have to put the name of our view so let's say we put live view or something if we run here, this is gonna tell us that live view is not found. And uh, the, all we need to do is go to resources, views, and then click on new file, and then call this live view.php. And now we can just say, hello. So we're just adding code here, and we can copy the code that we had here before and paste it. So we have that there and, and we're just, putting our, our code in here. You will ask why these things don't work and stuff, but the gist of this is that we can we can add a file here where we can add words, so a string, and we can also add PHP code. And with this PHP code, we could even use a variable. So we could say name, which doesn't exist, so it's just gonna complain. But from the route, we could say view, and now we could pass an array with data, so same name, live stream. And then now we, we're we putting a variable there, so we could do something like this, hello live stream. And this that we're passing as the name could even be a variable. So we could pass that, you know, we could make another route here where we, for instance, pass the name on the URL as a parameter. So here we have hello name and we're passing the variable name as the name to the view. So we can do here, hello, no, or for people who are on the live stream, we can do hello Chandra or hello Luis, hello John Mark. So we can do here many variables and this is actually dynamic country, uh, content. What this means is that the content that you can see there, that you can see on, on this website, is dynamically generated. There is only one route defined hello and then the name uh, variable. And that route is dynamic because every time we change the, the name parameter, it's going to regenerate the HTML code that you can see here and return again. All right. so. Once you have this understanding that we can have a route to which we can pass or return a view and then pass uh, a set of parameters, so we can actually we can change this. So let's just take a look at changing this code here. So we're saying, okay, load the live view when I load the, the root URL, return that view and pass it the name live stream before rendering. So hello, then printing here live stream, and then the, the exclamation bang. So we load that route URL, and then we have that hello live stream. What the blade templating system that we saw before here does is make it a bit better to our eyes so we're not writing a view, a web view with PHP, but with blade syntax. So if we look here at the basics, we have blade templates. And these blade templates are a powerful template engine that is included with Laravel and unlike some PHP en engines, Blade does not restrict you from using plain PHP code in your templates. That means that you can add PHP or Blade syntax interchangeably wherever you want on the same view. All right, the only thing we need to do, as you can see here, this file is called live dash or yeah, live dash view dot PHP. The only thing to, we need to do to be able to use blade syntax is rename the file and then add the dot blade dot php to it automatically this is gonna continue working as if we hadn't changed anything but now we can do this instead for instance this is blade syntax right this is a lot nicer you have this thing here whereas we had this here before those two do the same but this 
or, or let's say this is a shorthand for this right these two are a shorthand for this part and then this part here so we're gonna get rid of that one so we can comment that out that's uh, the way that late comments code and now we just get this one here as I said before we could there are many nice things that late lets us do and let me just one second so what I wanted to say before you can now and and once you have the proper extensions Visual Studio Code makes it really easy to write our views. So I can type HTML and then tab, and I'm not sure. So I have the Emmet abbreviation extension for Visual Studio Code. That's important because you don't, I don't know if you get that for free. So I type HTML and then I press tab. And then I get these two open and closing tags and I press enter. And I get that tabbing automatically done. I get four spaces or a tab, depending on what you have your Visual Studio Code set up to. You can see, you can see, I think right here that you have those four spaces. But if I were to click here, I could select and say using spaces or how many spaces you want or use tabs to indent. So let's go back. So I do HTML tab, then press enter. I don't know if I can do directly the enter. Yeah, so I can also do enter twice. So I can do HTML, enter, enter again. And then now I do my head, which is my website's header. And I do my body. And then I can do, for instance, an H1. So let's do H1. I can do my, my paragraph and I can do more paragraphs. So now we have, this is the basic structure for a website that we have put here. And we're not using anything. We're not using the name. We're not adding any content. In fact, if we go to our website, we'll see it's empty. You can go here and see the structure is there, but nothing really gets rendered because we haven't added any content. And now what we can do is that we can go into the header, for instance, add a title to our website and we'd say stream. Now that's going to be read and where it says web.test here, we're going to get the title, right? So we're getting nice title and the URL. We can keep adding content. So we can now go into Visual Studio Code. So now our title is gonna be my sample title or maybe live 14. And this is the real size of this is that. And I'm zooming in with uh, Chrome's command plus. And a paragraph is this is January seven live stream. Thanks for watching, right? So we can put this into a, an italics tag and, and then we have this, right? We have our website. It's right now static is dynamically generated, but it's dynamically generating static content. So we could cast this, but for the purpose of now, let's just, let's just keep going and see what we can do here. All right. We've mentioned before that we're passing a name. Right, we're passing a name to this and we can say, for instance, that the name is going to be live 14, what we're passing. We're not using that yet, but we could do, as we mentioned before, we could do here name and then that would be the name. We're not seeing anything, but that's what's happening. We could also use the name here for the title and maybe add that symbol. And now we're getting that on the title. As we change the name variable, so we go here and now we change, let's say for next week, live 15, then these changes and these changes here as well, as uh, so we're passing variable. What else could we do? So we could do, for instance, pass, let's say we could pass a set of image names, for instance. So we could say images and we're going to pass an array of images or image names. And for this purpose, what we're going to do is uh, just go here and get the, the name or the URLs for a few of these drawings, just to make sure that we can load some content. So here we have this one, we're going to get the images at 300 of width. And let's actually just, let's actually just get the, the JPEG URLs in the variables and let's keep this content here. So what I'm trying to do is just to show you how we could pass, let's say, three names or three URLs of images, and then show them on the website with iterating with blade instead of PHP. All right. So we have this one, we have this one, and we have this one. All right. 
So you have these images and right now the only thing I'm going to do is with PHP normally you could do this thing. So you could say for each images as image and then you can print the image, right? But in Blade you will just do uh, for each loop which you can say images image it's really similar but better to write and then we put a paragraph and then we put the image inside of here which is just going to print one paragraph for each image which is not actually rendering the image it's rendering the url of the image so we have here these three urls which are being printed which is great and i'm not sure i think there was a way this is not going to work, right? Yeah, so I think it was the, we can get the loops index here. So we can see the, the index value of each of the loops that we're seeing. So zero, one, and two. And you can do things like adding one if you want to show, okay, one, two, and three. You're already uh, given some things here in the loop for free. So for instance, let me see, I think I can do, I'm not sure if I can do this even. Yeah, okay. You see, even is one for this one because it's number uh, two. So this is odd, even, odd, even. And you know, if we get more items, we will see that even, odd, even, odd. And that way that could serve if you're building a table. You could say, for instance, if loop is even and diff, we could make this bold. And then we'll have to close that. We're going to make bold only the urls that are even right the two four six eight etc etc so right now we don't really care about that so i'm going to take it out to simplify the code but what you saw before is that we had these images https none of the ma imgix.net image u and then the url and then at the end i had this formatting code to make the images smaller so we have that code there, we're going to remove the loop code and we're going to simply do this, right? So we have that full URL and if I get any of these URLs, I'm going to get that image. So now uh, all I have to do is change this uh, paragraph tag for an image tag and get this as the URL. So we could say, all right, so we have now, we could write here our PHP code and say, this is going to be my url which we don't need to to write blade here so we can just simply do this and now that we're doing that first let's try that the url value is good yeah so that's working in the same way and now we are going to instead of having a p tag or a paragraph tag we're going to create an image tag with that url as the source and then on the alt we could add something but we're not gonna add. actually let's just add the image name and that's it. So we now have these images here that are being rendered at 300 pixels of width. And we have this definition of the image with these URL parameters here. And I could change this size now to 150 and it will change over all of them. This is a simple technique. So let's actually make the images 300 pixel wide and the actual image that we're loading 600 to make them have a bit more resolution. All right, and we're gonna just leave the three initial images that we had before. All right, so far we've just been passing values to a route that we were coding and making sure that we can display a set of images that we're passing as, as images on our image URLs and doing a for loop here to make sure that for each of those URLs, we construct, so for each of those image names, we construct their URL and then we show the image on, on screen. So we could, you could do pixels there or whatever. All right. For purposes of, of this, we could, let's say brightness to, I don't know the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I M G I X, we can add parameters to the URL to, to modify this like brightness of the image or like sharpness or other things. One thing that you can see here is, let me see, let's see if we, for instance, just do PHP block here and just say, 
uh, params we're just going to use the numbers uh, one three oh, no four four point two six six point seven six point nine for instance so we could add another for each loop here so say and for each and then use these this param here for the brightness so i think if brightness is one we just get the the normal brightness and it is, what we're going to do here is brightness is going to be one multiplied by par one minus one multiplied by par all right yeah so you can see the only thing we're doing here is and this is failing for some reason so maybe we need to i don't really know how to do this here yeah okay so th this is just a, a sample here but the thing is we're doing a, a for loop or a for each loop inside of another for each loop and we're passing variables from the routes into the the view and then uh, using those so i could now add one more image to my parameters so here so to my variables of the view reload that and then we'll have that new image uh, there as well so we have a dynamic variable in there all right and maybe we just add here uh, jump and we just get that there all right so let's make a, a recap right like we could also add styling here that we haven't added and we could say as we did before for everything font family is going to be system ui and font size is going to be one rem which probably is the same font family and we're going to make this font size 1.3 all right to yeah and now we're just going to do this like that that's it all right so that was a simple overview on how to how to use laravel with blade templating and now uh, we're going to see more of these things over the course of other sessions but i hope that was a, a good introduction this is something that if we, for instance, go here and uh, were to create different pages, right? Like manually, which you wouldn't really do, but let's just try it. So this get, for instance, or, or disk, right? So we just leave here this and we say, okay, the name of this page is disk and the URL is disk. So now we can go here to disk and just get that, that page, right? From any page, we could link to other pages, right? And this is normal html we could say okay to go here it's my home page and now to go to disk is my diskette so in every view now we can go to home or to diskette we've created like a menu bar on our website pretty basic and and we could add this to to the cloud i'm going to quickly show you I'm just going to log into something here all right so I have a, an experimental server here that is simply the same thing that we have here on my local machine, but on the web. So for those of you who are connected online, if you want to try it, I have this sample project page, laravel.com, which you can go and see this here. And I have a Laravel application that is live and is running and I can go to my, if I click on here, I can go to my routes web php file and see all the routes that are in there and i could quickly add a new route so i could click quickly add here down to the bottom route get live function i'm connected to the server machine through ssh that's a protocol that allows us to connect with the command line to the command line of the Linux server that is running these websites. So this is my function and I define it here. And let's say I return hello live live stream. We can. So now if I go to larle.com slash live, you can see that this URL works. And if any of you that are watching this live want to go, you can try larle.com slash live and you'll be able to see this this content on your machine because we're actually editing a route that is running on the web not on my local machine so go ahead and try it and let me know if that works just out of curiosity i'm gonna 
remove that in, in a few seconds. So this, if you want to try it, the moment is now. So git checkout uh, routes web. If I run this, that URL will disappear. So let me know when you have tried it. and I'll go ahead and, and run that command to remove that. All right, so we have covered a bit of Laravel. Uh, I just wanted to take a look now at Laravel TensorFlow. Just want to see what Laravel machine learning integrations of TensorFlow we can do, or if there's any packages that we could use now to use a Laravel, a, a TensorFlow model Laravel. All right, nothing here. Symfony process. Yes, it works. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for testing. And one thing you can do, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so now what I'm trying to do is if we look at Express, I think I have a an Express tutorial. So Node.js, HTTP, let me see, not that one. So I have this video here, which I won't, I won't really play right now, but this video that you can see here shows how to do something really similar, like create get routes and post routes and things like that on Node.js using Express. This is something that, that I mentioned uh, before. And it's really similar. It's just that that only gives you that. Laravel gives us a lot more stuff that we're going to be able to, um, to use over the course of many other uh, live streams. So I'll post this, uh, a link to this video on the Discord channel. All right, cool. So let me see. All right, so let's remove that route that I created from there and that should not work anymore. So laravel.com slash live returns that website doesn't exist. Okay, blah, blah, blah. So it doesn't seem like there might be that many packages. PHP ML, machine learning for PHP packages. Let's look at the packages. TensorFlow serving PHP client. This is an experimental binding to TensorFlow. Okay, so this is the one we just looked at. We just some useful stuff to use TensorFlow JS on G. TensorFlow server client for gRPC, highly efficient, easy to use neural network, organizer. Okay, yeah, so there's not a lot of stuff that we can do at the moment there, but uh, the important part of, that, of why we looked at this is that now we could go into the, the live repo that we have with examples from classifying from ResNet, for instance, and we could just simply copy all this code into one of our views. So let's say, I, and th this is, this is important. This is where everything wraps up. Why am I showing you all of this? We could create an application and I'm going to delete all of this now where, for instance, if I put here, so what is this? This is ResNet. So TFJS ResNet, for instance, we could do a function. Well, and one more thing, there is a shorthand for what we did before to return the view where if we do this URL, so tfjs resnet and we can map it directly to a view so for example tfjs resnet right this is exactly the same as if we were to do something like tfjs resnet and then return view tfjs resnet what is the difference the difference is that this one doesn't really have any parameters this one doesn't have any parameters right and this one doesn't either but here we could maybe create here date, maybe make a, a new date or something, and then pass here a parameter, pass the date to the view. But if we don't need any variables, at least for now, it's easier to just go here to our views, tfjs resnet.blade.php, and then we can paste this code. So what happens now is that all the code that we did last week, so now we can go to web test or let's actually change the, the URL. So if we go to our valet links that we saw before and visualize all these links, we can see that we have here the, the web link to web.test and this. So I can do valet and link and now valet link live. So I choose the name of the link that I want. So now web.test doesn't work anymore because we got to go to live.test, which is not found. So we've deleted the base route. So we can do route get function and then just return, I don't know, none of my live stream. And then that's there. So now we go to that route that we just created, tfjs slash resnet. And what we can see is exactly the, 
the code that we did last time. So we're serving the, this is a bit frozen. This was a bit frozen because it was pulling the, the ResNet model from the internet. So here we load ResNet 50 and then we predict with a random input and then we get the output tensor. This is where we left it in live 11. And we didn't really get to input a, an image from disk or from our machine or anything. But that's something that is really interesting that, that we should get to do. And maybe we could do that by loading the image directly with Laravel in PHP and then passing it to, J to JavaScript or by just drag and dropping the image into, into. All right. Do you guys have any questions? So I'm going to take another quick break and, and come back. Maybe we end up early or maybe we take a look at blotter.js. Let me know if you have any specific questions, anything you want to take a look at or just any comments. And if you're watching this offline, feel free to leave your comments on the video comments. I'll reply later and are looking forward to your comments. Hello. Okay. We're back. So we have uh, just seen this overview that I hope that helps us move forward a bit faster on, over the next weeks. This is just one option to deploying websites as we saw in another live streams. We could also have used Glitch. It's another way to, to create websites really quickly. And Laravel is not that quick. It allows more knowledge, but I just want to create it. I just wanted to create those tutorials so I can share them later and I have them as a reference. So uh, people who don't know how to build things like web routing and things like that have access to them. Okay. So what we could do on glitch is that we could also copy and paste that code. So we could copy all the code. Uh, CSS and the reference to the JavaScript included here. And we could go and see a preview. So let's save this. And now we're going to open this a new window and open the console quickly. This is here on this Mirage Humble Jasper automated uh, URL generated by Glitch. And we can execute and run this here as well. There are nice things that we can do if we use Laravel and mainly or mostly host those applications in production. And yeah, if you go to this page, uh, you can actually execute this right now. So I can even open this, let's say on an incognito window, go, and then this is public. This is loading ResNet and now it's going to do the prediction. So yeah, we can expect to see more of that over the next weeks. What else is here? All right, let's actually make a, a sample glitch test with hello web page. I'm going to change this to blotter. Does that show blotter? Okay, that was free, not something that anyone had used before. So I'm just going to go with that and right here blotter.js. And let's see if blotter.js is available on a CDN. And it is. So we're going to copy that copy the URL, copy script tag, which is even better. So we're just going to load here the library. Cool. And let's go back to blotter.js. All right. Before we go, just to make sure we have some content from this live stream. So we are going to add a slides here, right? Blotter and maybe even a video capture of this. Oh, so we got this video. We can maybe drop a bit. Okay. Okay. So for some context, I'm just trying to prepare a few slides to make a proper tutorial on blotter and, and just try it out. And we're going to go here. We're going to go there. We're going to get this video to MP4. We're going to open live and tutorial talks. And this MP4 is nine times smaller than a MOF correspondent. All right. So we go here, we're just going to add this here and we're going to, so we got that. And now we get the materials. Okay. Blotter materials. And now we have this thing here. Okay. Let's get started. 
Okay, so do I have control here? Hi everyone, it's Nona here and we're gonna briefly see what blotter.js is and how to use it on your own website. Blotter.js is a JavaScript API that you can use for free, it's open source, that allows you to do cool stuff like this one, like visual effects that you use shaders with many different materials. Actually, I think it, they have support for five materials on your browser. So Blotter, you can spell this, is an open source library that has its own website. And we're gonna see right now, as it says here for unconventional text effects on the web. These are the five different effects that uh, you can achieve at the moment, as far as I know. And I really like uh, this one, the one with color channel color splitting, but it's really intriguing for me because I have been looking at this for weeks and or months, and I actually haven't had the chance to play with it. Let's go and do some of that right now. As I mentioned before, it's open source. Uh, it's uh, Bradley at GitHub, the creator of this. It seems it's Bradley Griffith. Thanks a lot for creating this and uh, contributing to the open source community. Manuel Vargas and Ox Flotus have also collaborated. But yeah, so you got blotter.js.org and find more information. So let's code. The, if we take a look here about their website, right? So this is a website where you can download different versions of the app, minified or uncompressed. You can go to the source code if you click on this uh, button at the bottom of the page. And you can also just see an overview of what this is. It's GLSL based, baked text effects with ease. At lacing effects in a single WebGL back buffer, animation loop, what blotter isn't. Any text you pass to blotter can be individually configured using familiar site property. You can use custom face font faces through the font spec. However, blotter ultimately renders the text passed to it into canvas elements. This means render text won't be selectable. The blotter text is great for elements like titles, headings, and text. Okay, let me repeat that. What blotter isn't? Actually, what Blotter does when you pass to it text is that it renders it into a canvas, which means it's rasterizing it. You cannot really select text when you add it to a Blotter uh, canvas, but you can customize it by passing it font faces. That means that you can customize how it renders and how it shows, but not make text selectable after the fact. Blotter is not recommended for long texts because it probably is not that performant. All right, it's great for elements like titles, headings, and texts used for graphic purposes, but not really for rendering text that has to be read. All right, basics, plain text, ready-made effects, observation. All right, observation. So these observations seem to be a playground where they show a snippet of code and then the code rendered at the bottom liquid distort material. So if we go to material, we can see liquid distort material, flies material, sliding door material, rolling distort material, and channel split material. If we go to basics and maybe just change this channel split material, maybe, only maybe this will work, channel split material. Let's go to the documentation. So this is the if we go to documentation, here you can see the documentation on how to use the code, create, construct a new blotter instance, and then all the code that you need to uh, configure it, right? The blotter material de defines the rendering type that we are using, and you can, I think, dynamically set the material. I'm not too sure about that. Blotter material, blah, blah, blah. All right, a lot of stuff here. All right, so let's actually get coding and uh, go. So right now here I have an empty glitch app. So I just called it blotter and put it at blotter.glitch.me. So you might be able to visit that as well. I came here into a, a CDN. So this is a place where we can just use the assets as JS JavaScript directly. So we can copy either the URL and get the URL of the library minified or copy the tag. So this is the HTML tag that we need to paste here for blotter to be loaded on our website. So if we reload this thing, we can see that blotter is actually being loaded on our website. All right, so our web app is loading and we can actually have this uh, split view that will uh, show the preview uh, right above me 
of what we're coding and we can hide this side thing that we don't really need even though we could write our code in here the blotter code all right so let's close this and this and let's make sure that we have the documentation maybe we can use one of these uh, basic text so div id plain text so we can write here our div so hide there let's change this is our first try at blotter.js so we put a div here so we have to go in here and our div is going to be to the use id my text all right so we have the javascript code here that we're gonna write under this item so we're going to let's see how i can do this so you can see everything okay so let's just write the code here so we have okay so our text is going to be a new blotter.text instance we're going to call it uh, sample and we're going to pass to it the properties here for what we want it to be rendered with so it's going to be here we're going to want enter and system ui for the size we're going to put 20 for the fill we're going to put let's say red for now all right so we have our text variable defined the material is going to be new blotter material blotter our instance is actually going to be a blotter instance with this material and then text we're going to be text the element we're going to get document get element by id text bar scope blotter for text scope append to element that's sample now that we're here we can change this text to my life and the color to gray and now if we change this material to liquid distort material for instance we can see from the list of materials here there is this liquid distort material this won't work why won't this work because we have to load that uh, material as a separate javascript file so for instance we have this one here liquid distro material we copy the script tag and now we go to the index.html we load that file here and then when we reload this uh, url or see this preview here we can see that that this is working right so now we know we have these three things here and by going to our cdn we could also load the channel split material min file and put it here and we could simply go and now change the the size of our font hide this thing here channel split material and now we'd go to here next to the code and here so now we have this thing here that if we zoom in we see it pixelates it's noisy because we have there is there is some grain to it and it's actually waiting for us to to change and interact with it so we're gonna put here this and i don't really know if we can add things like font weight and, and such for now we're gonna have this here all right so we have this here and what we saw on blotter's website is that you can change uh, things according to the mouse so how your mouse is, is moving you rotation you offset and it seems my computer is uh, getting a bit slow by me opening a lot of these windows all right let me see if i have more of them not here cool cool all right so we can actually customize things here so we could say as we saw on the other code example here basics we have the materials dot uniforms dot speed dot value so these are the the uniform values that we're passing to the shader so we can do here da, 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 da. so actually let's take a look at this documentation of this material so we're going to zoom in here u offset type so offset value u offset value cool all right so one okay yeah, so this seems like it's starting to work. So we're changing values of the shader and 
we could we have the type the uniform type in pass mean and single value should not change this property u rotation so we could change the u rotation parameter maybe to 45 seems to be the, the default apply blur so zero no blur so now everything's perfectly in there and then we have animate noise animate noise deselect that so if you set the name of, uh, of one of these uniforms wrong the shader will crash because you're, you're trying to set a value that doesn't exist and i think that's it so i'm not sure how they're doing on the on the main site so th this effect is pretty cool so this uh, this v here so i guess that apply blur true or false so it doesn't really have an in between so we do apply blur one and then for offset we'll just do two let me see if i can set the style so for instance if i do my text font weight equals a 700 not sure I'd like to see how to change the the weight the weight of the font as well all right so now we're here let me see if i could get the mouse x on the canvas scope dom element all right so we can actually scope dom element let's try to log this all right so we have the context of the element so we can pass that as our canvas so if we do this event let's move so if we do scope dom element event now i'll put this above here so you can see a bit more event listener and on mouse move function event that's it console log. so now we have this thing here mouse move okay so we're tracking this event now every time we move the mouse and now what we want to do is that every time we're going to get get the mouse position on the canvas so we're just gonna paste this function here to get that mouse position and we just get the the position equals get mouse position with scope dot the element and the event that we're passing and we console log our position once again cool now we're getting now we're getting somewhere so cool now we can see here that we go from 400 to zero from 400 to zero and what we're going to do is change so let's say our offset is going to be 400 divided by 400 so the position x we know what yeah position x divided 400 so we will get 400 it's one and zero all right so let's try now to do material uniforms you offset equal uh, value equals offset Let's see what happens nice all right seems like it's working somehow so we are going to multiply that so math at value and i want to make that minus 200 cool and we could actually because now the the y-axis is not doing anything really so we could actually do something on the um, we'll close this one on the y-axis so right now let me see what can you see right now okay cool we're getting close we're getting close to, to finishing this up so this is here so let's just put a simpler text here again i want to see that when i'm on the middle so let's say that x is going to be now 50 and y it's going to be 50 maybe so we want to do here x divided 2 and here's x and we'll do that oh i see so this is not really all right so i think that's it the only thing i would say is if i can do scope dom element with so yeah i can get these ones here to make this work a bit better yeah so this is yeah and probably what we wanted to do is just the distance 
Okay, let's calculate the distance. So we have a um, zero zero the math square root of math power of x to two power of position y two. All right, it seems I got to it <laughs> finally. So yeah, so now by distance to the center point, we were changing the. This is all gradual. Cool. Let me see. Lastly, if I can put this to be entire so position absolute at top zero. All right. That's the demo. Let me see if I can just whatever. Well, so this is today's demo. So I just wanted to show blotter.js as well. And I think it's pretty cool. Pretty nice to, to add effects to your website. I'm not sure if I can maybe add negative effects so it doesn't bounce back and forth. But yeah, okay, so that's it. I hope you you like seeing a bit of JavaScript to, to use Blotter. I know I've been talking about it for a bit. This was Livestream 14 and let's wrap up. So thanks a lot. I would encourage you to go ahead and like the video if this is the type of content you'd like to see or if you're enjoying my other videos and subscribe if you want to get notified when I upload new videos or when I go live next. Thanks a lot for being there. I think the community keeps growing and I'm really happy to see some of you folks already interacting there. You can join us at nono.ma slash discord to join the discord server. And yeah, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.